Sean, it's my esteemed honor to give you the first question because you blew off the pre-panel pre huddle. Uh, <laughs> it was by unanimous vote from the panel. So how are you maximizing your current capabilities against the vast array of threats in the PACOM AOR, and which new capability would assist you most in the future? Okay, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the first question. Uh, I think it's important to uh, really set the baseline for this panel uh, with what are we doing currently with our systems uh, in the uh, AOR and me as a 94th double embassy commander and how am I executing and what will I need uh, in the future which really set the uh, table for the uh, rest of the uh, panel. So as you look at the uh, operation environment uh, that I'm working in, in the PACOM AOR, and you look at the tyranny of distance, the uh, threat of near peer uh, adversaries, and as General Hyten highlighted, probably the most unpredictable um, threat uh, in the region. Uh, it requires uh, several things uh, to be successful uh, within that uh, AOR. So in the 94th, uh, as, as most of you know, we execute a real war mission day in and day out, and we execute it uh, through the Joint Force out of the uh, 613th AOC uh, across the entire uh, AOR to be able to uh, do that, not only regional, but also the uh, Homeland uh, Defense Mission. And uh, I really do it in four uh, ways. Uh, first is I have to apply a joint solution to the uh, TBM problem set across the entire AOR. There's no other way I'll be able to do this mission uh, without that, and I'll highlight some specifics uh, as I move forward. I have to optimize the current capabilities that I have because you'll hear a lot of talk about capabilities that'll be here within the five to 10 year range. I don't have the time to wait on that, so I gotta take what I have now, uh, maximize those systems and, and employ them and get, get ready for, for any type of a future fight. Uh, I have to integrate offensive and defensive capabilities uh, you know, that comes through my attack op cell, leveraging the uh, JFAC that I work with inside of the 613th AOC, and also leverage the multi-domain task force concept that USHRPAC is leading the effort for, uh, that many of you have heard General Brown talk about, and I'll highlight that uh, a little bit also. And then I have to leverage uh, my partner capacity. Uh, and, and one of the great things in the uh, PACOM AOR, there are several uh, partners that possess our systems uh, and I have to be able to leverage those as part of our overall uh, plan. So starting with uh, applying the uh, joint force to every problem set, the great thing about me uh, in my command is we're integrated day in and day out. I live inside of the PACAF headquarters, and uh, about 55 of my personnel work day in and day out inside of the 613th AOC uh, integrated with the uh, ADC. Uh, slash JFAC. So that gives me a step uh, ahead right off the bat. And I have a ADSI, General Shaughnessy, who really understands his role as an ADSI and really leveraged me as his deputy area air defense commander. Uh, so he relies on me uh, through the uh, JTAMD, uh, Joint Theater Air Missile Defense Board process, uh, to, to execute uh, the area air defense mission uh, on a uh, joint uh, spectrum. So, you know, every time we execute an exercise, or just day in and day out real world missions, we pull together our uh, JTAMD team, which includes the JFAC, JFLIC, uh, JIFMIC, uh, and, and everybody that supports the integrated air and missile defense mission. And through that process, uh, we apply, uh, whether it's a Aegis BMD ship, uh, whether it's a defensive counter air mission against a cruise missile threat, the joint force uh, to every problem set uh, that we have. So. You know, and the great thing about it, we just don't apportion assets by fighting out of the 613th AOC and being integrated across the theater. We're able to leverage things like Army assets uh, with Navy assets, TP2 radar, Q&A, uh, Aegis ship. So we're able to leverage the entire joint force. Uh, optimizing uh, current systems, a as you've heard, uh, we PDB-8, uh, completed in 35th ADA Brigade and almost complete in uh, 1-1 ADA. So the latest and greatest technology. And then, uh, you know, we as a, uh, uh, a force have to demand 
the latest and greatest interceptors to go along with those uh, up upgraded uh, systems. So we bring the latest uh, MSC missiles, uh, several of them out into our AOR, and that goes into advocating for all the current uh, capabilities that are out there through Juons and ONS uh, to help us get whatever's out there, whatever's emerging uh, uh, capability to be able to employ it and then put it into play. Also, our own Army systems, you know, THAAD, Patriot, uh, working to uh, ensure that those systems are integrated uh, and currently uh, we're, we're ongoing work with industry and within the Army to maximize the uh, capabilities between those two systems and maximize the effects uh, that those two systems can have uh, in the battle space on the battlefield. And then finally, uh, integrating the offensive and defensive uh, capabilities. Uh, through that, I have one of the pillars, as we all know, is the attack ops uh, portion in my attack ops cell uh, within my command does a phenomenal job of integrating with not only the JFAC, but also the BCD uh, within the uh, 613th AOC seats in order to be able to maximize effects uh, so that it's not only uh, our defensive fight, but we're taking the fight uh, to the adversary uh, also. You heard me highlight a little bit of the multi-domain task force uh, as part of the integrating offensive and defensive capabilities. During uh, our last exercise, uh, we, we essentially uh, presented Future pack uh, with some of our assets, a, a multi-domain concept uh, that was integrated into the exercise that demonstrated offensive and defensive capabilities across multiple uh, platforms. And uh, we were able to gain temporal uh, advantage over our adversary uh, by doing it. So as we continue to incorporate this uh, concept into several exercises, we'll, we'll be able to formulate as we move down the future how we can better maximize uh, th those opportunities and capabilities. And then leveraging uh, partner uh, capacity, uh, as I highlighted, you know, whether it's the Japanese, Koreans, and, and then emerging capabilities with Australia. Right now we're doing a, a tabletop exercise with our Australian partners as they look, uh, as they're purchasing their systems, looking to be interoperable uh, with us. That brings phenomenal capability across the spectrum where we may have gaps that they could potentially fill uh, with their capability. And then you look at areas like Korea and Japan who have uh, our systems, uh, it's utilizing them into the overall uh, defense design uh, is critical. And then that leads into the uh, next part of the question, which is the what do I need uh, moving forward in staying on partner capacity. Uh, one of the things we have to do is we have to work through uh, all the uh, policies uh, to ensure we're, we're interoperable to where we not only build them as part of the defense design, but we're able to integrate them seamlessly into the architecture where we essentially create the best sensor shooter architecture, sensor shooter agnostic, uh, to where we're not differentiating human in the loop. We can, we can automatically do that uh, depending on uh, what sensor picks up the uh, uh, threat and then what uh, system's available uh, to shoot it. But with the challenge of, you know, capability and capacity that I highlighted earlier, uh, a lot has been said what we need uh, in the uh, future over the next 10 years. Uh, but what I'll try to do uh, from a warfighter perspective is, is give you a few more specifics <coughs> on what we see uh, as, as we look at, you know, gaps and uh, areas we can uh, highlight. And I'll, and I'll do it along the uh, pillars uh, of uh, theater missile defense. So if you look at active defense, 360 degree ground-based integrated air missile defense systems uh, providing uh, uh, intercept capability to meet the uh, threats across the spectrum, uh, an area that uh, we can use uh, in the future. Uh, you heard a lot about high energy type, I, I won't say the specific weapon, but something that's uh, rapidly deployable and sustainable to mitigate magazine depth uh, challenges that we have uh, within the uh, theater. Uh, persistent overhead uh, discriminating sensor capability of queuing joint integrated air missile defense forces uh, is something we would like to see. Synchronized non-kinetic and kinetic capability against UAS uh, systems. Uh, capability uh, to neutralize the uh, threat in all three phases. We, we heard a little discussion about the boost phase, uh, mid-course <coughs> and terminal phase. And then if you look at the attack ops, uh, seamless integration 
uh, of the attack ops uh, portfolio. Portfolio. We do it in the JFAC, but it's, it's majority done uh, human in the loop. So any type of system that allows that automated process to once again best uh, shooter uh, will be uh, a, a, a good thing to have uh, within the uh, AOR also. And then improvements on launch on remote type capability of any system uh, shooter and in any way we can continue to flood uh, the sky with electrons so we improve the uh, sensor capability uh, will be an added uh, capability that will benefit uh, us across the force. Okay, thanks, Sean. Rob Lyons, focus, focusing on Army and MDA's touch points. What are MDA's priorities for developing missile defense capabilities for both the homeland and regional defense to ensure we stay ahead of our adversaries? Uh, sir, thanks. And, and watch uh, the clock. Sir, thanks, and uh, first off to, to General Hamm and the, the entire AUSA team. Uh, on behalf of Lieutenant General Greaves, the Director for the Missile Defense Agency, thanks so much for asking MDA to be a, a part of today's uh, symposium. Uh, very important partners uh, that we see the Army with, with, with MDA. Um, and we definitely value and benefit from the close cooperation and partnership uh, with the Army and developing and fielding elements of the ballistic missile defense system. Uh, that are operated by Army soldiers. And in particular, the ground-based mid-course yeah, defense or GMD system, uh, THAAD and TIPI-2 radars in the forward-based mode are prime examples of the successful cooperation between um, uh, MDA's development, testing and fielding of those capabilities and Army's leadership uh, on the other side in operating those systems and managing uh, the dot mil pf uh, integration uh, of that capability. To accomplish our mission uh, to develop and deploy a layered uh, BMDS to defend the United States is deployed forces, our allies, our friends uh, from ballistic missile attacks against uh, all ranges in all phases of flight. Uh, MDA must continue to collaborate with the Army to support uh, current and future needs of the combatant commanders um, with the development, testing, and integration of, of those capabilities. So to do that, the Director um, MDA has laid out three agency priorities support, to support the broader defense strategy. Um, and to guide the execution of, of our development activities. And those are increased reliability, uh, enhanced engagement uh, capability and capacity, and addressing uh, the advanced threat. So if you recall General Heighton's priorities um, of improving sensors, more reliable and advanced uh, kill vehicles and capacity, sure. those, those are nested tightly uh, within the STRATCOM uh, commander's uh, priorities, which, which is a good thing because that's where um, STRATCOM integrates the combatant command and the service requirements uh, and provides those to MDA in the form of a, a prioritized capability list which guides um, our development. So just quickly walking through those three priorities and some of the touch points that we're working with the Army. Um, so in terms of uh, increasing system reliability to build warfighter confidence, um, there's a couple ways we do that. Uh, one is uh, with, with testing. Uh, th that's both hardware in the loop. Uh, ground tests and flight tests. Um, some of the, the recent examples uh, General Dickinson pointed out in, in his earlier remarks with uh, FTG-15, the first ICBM intercept for the GMD system. And then we had two uh, very successful THAAD flight tests this past July uh, in Kodiak, uh, Alaska. Um, the first intercept against uh, an IRBM and then uh, at the end of July, um, an experimental test, <coughs> uh, FET-01, uh, to um, collect data on, um, on a, a target with, with some uh, enhanced countermeasures. Uh, and that one also proved to be a successful intercept. So the second way um, to, to build warfighter confidence is, is through reliability of, of the elements themselves. Um, one, one example of um, you know, a critical part of how NORTHCOM determines and then how the Army GMD operators from the 100th Missile Defense uh, Brigade execute shock doctrine um, uh, to, to defeat the threats is, is part of that calculus is the reliability of, of, of the interceptors. So recognizing this, MDA is developing a redesigned kill vehicle um, to address the evolving threat and improve uh, kill vehicle reliabil re yeah, reliability. So the design of, and development of, of that RKV, uh, we use kind of an open architecture, uh, common interfaces and standards, which make uh, upgrades easier, uh, broadens the the, uh, the vendor and supply base, therefore it makes it more uh, reliable, producible, testable, and cost effective. So the first um, control test flight um, 
is, uh, of the RKB is in FY20, and then there's intercept flight tests in, in 20 and, and, and 20, I'm sorry, 21 and 22. So 22 is kind of the, the first RKBs you'll, you'll see in service. Uh, the other way we build reliability uh, to enhance warfighter confidence is through our cyber testing. I know that's kind of a, a hot topic across all warfighting functions. Uh, so MDA recognizes that. So in addition to our um, cybersecurity technical standards, assessing supply chains and looking at in, uh, external threats and insider threats, um, this year MDA executed kind of our first in collaboration with uh, OSD, DAT, and E, uh, our cybersecurity vulnerability and penetration assessment on DMV systems. We started those with the TIPI 2s, uh, and, and next month we're going to progress and do uh, those, those uh, assessments and adversarial assessments uh, on, on THAAD. Uh, our second priority, increasing engagement, <coughs> capability, and capacity. Um, we're expanding the number of field interceptors, building out uh, ground and space architecture with the aim of capturing birth to death uh, tracking. We're improving uh, discrimination and integration, leveraging international partnerships for affordability and inter interoperability, and then obviously we're working closely with the services and combatant commands uh, to, to integrate all, all those. A, a couple quick touch points. First on the capacity side, as, 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 as you all know, so we have 44 uh, GBIs uh, in place now between Vandenberg and, and Fort Greeley, Alaska. In, in this year, in 2018, MDA is initiating the GMD portion of the department's uh, Missile Defeat and Defense Enhancement, or MDD, initiative, which will expand the capacity of the GBI fleet uh, to 64 uh, by the end of, uh, of uh, 2023. Another uh, capability increase we're, we're doing uh, was, was with the THAAD interceptors. So it's also part of that MDDE budget amendment. Uh, there was an inclusion of uh, 50 additional THAAD interceptors, enabling MDA to continue to increase the Army's uh, strategic reserve of, of THAAD interceptors. Um, so by the end of FY18, uh, MDA will have delivered 205 uh, interceptors. Um, uh, switching over to kind of some of the capability enhancements, um, one of the most significant ones from the GMD perspective is the two to three stage uh, selectable booster. Um, we're developing the option to either fly GBIs using all three booster stages we're not igniting that, that third stage, uh, offering a performance similar to a, a two-stage uh, boost. The operational benefit for that is it, it, it gives the, the warfighter, uh, NORTHCOM and the 100th Missile Defense uh, Brigade, um, additional battle space through shorter uh, engagement timelines. We're also uh, doing many upgrades to um, uh, the ground support system for, for, for GMD. On the THAAD side, for uh, capability enhancements, um, we are um, we're, we're working uh, um, upgrades to improve our ability to engage short, medium, and intermediate um, range ballistic missile threats. Um, look, working uh, enhanced debris mitigation, uh, improved interoperability with other BMDS assets, uh, and expanded um, defended area footprints via operation of uh, remoted that that launchers. Um, Mr. Pike mentioned one, another THAAD capability enhancement that, that we're working is the, the USFK uh, Joint Emergent Operational Need uh, Statement uh, requested uh, last year. Uh, as the department assigned lead to develop and deliver uh, that capability enhancement requested uh, from General Brooks, MDA is working closely with the Army, partnered very closely with Mr. Pike's team and LTPO, and then the, the, the Army's cross-functional uh, team lead, Brigadier General McIntyre, uh, to work through and, and ensure that we deliver um, the, the priorities that General Brooks has requested in terms of integrating the, the, the upper tier sensor and lower tier uh, interceptor um, uh, matches uh, in an accelerated uh, manner. And we're looking at about 36 months to, to complete um, his top three priorities. And then lastly, in terms of the, the um, addressing the advanced threat, there's, there's a couple touch points that we're working with the Army. The first is hypersonic threat defeat. Um, we, we've had, uh, we've been working in an analysis of alternatives and then we've had a, um, a hypersonic threat defeat summit uh, for which the Army was a, a strong partner um, in, in those activities. Uh, and then um, uh, from an from a interceptor capability, um, we're, we're working uh, 
uh, a multi-object kill vehicle. So right now that's in the um, um, technological risk reduction phase. Uh, so it's, it's, we're putting the foundation together for killing multiple lethal objects uh, with a single interceptor. So the more kill vehicles we can put on a single uh, interceptor, the higher uh, raid capacity for our GMD system um, and, and better for, for our warfighters. Um, our, um, right now, our, the risk reduction uh, phase began in 2017, so last year, and then our, uh, our first uh, technology demonstration is in the 2027 time frame. Okay. So, um, again, those are a quick run through for our, uh, our top three priorities, and uh, we appreciate working with uh, Army along the way. Okay, Rick DeFada from SMDC. You've put a lot of effort into developing tactical lasers, and many see them as the, uh, the panacea to IAMD challenges. But how close are we to really initiating a formal program, even if it's only into the maneuver shore ad realm? And watch the clock. I'm watching the clock, please. <laughs> you and Joe have five minutes because you promised the audience 30, and I got a stack of questions here. Okay. Um, so you so got two and a half. Questions? My boss covered this very well earlier. Um, if you know me, you know I have really appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about directed energy, but, but in, the, in a different way uh, from a, the non-skeptical side of this kind of thing. I, the Army is probably, um, number one, uh, operating in a team sport. I mean, we, we work with the Air Force, the Navy, Missile Defense Agency on requirements, uh, technology. We're, we're bringing along technologies and, and driving those towards the force. <coughs> Uh, you'll see one uh, up on Barry's chart, there's one little three little three word thing that says integrate directed energy. I'll tell you that that note has been on every one of those charts for about the past uh, 15 years or so. And there's been several plans to go do that. But I, I would tell you that we're getting awful close. And from a technology standpoint, w we've taken sort of a three pronged approach. The, the Army's main program, an Army capability enabler on the S&T side, is the, the uh, and I'll get into acronym HELL here uh, for so I'll try not to get into that. But the high energy laser <laughs> uh, tactical vehicle demonstrator is really putting 100 kW of energy into the same vehicle that Barry's developing for uh, IFTC. Uh, I recall going back to brief this to uh, then Gen uh, Brigadier General Thurgood, tell him, hey, here's, here's the progress we're making. And he looked at me and he said, hey, Rick, that's great, but I want all that ener laser energy to come out of one of the tubes in what I'm already fielding. And so I hate to say it, but we're not quite there yet. But we are on the, back on the right vehicle, and, uh, and we're no longer on the, on the HEMET as our, our direction. But to, to, in, uh, to enable that, we have a, a knowledge point. Uh, this year, we've integrated a 60 kW laser into the HEMET. Uh, and I'll, I'll note that that has never been done. First light will be later this year. We've never had that much energy out of a fiber laser system, a solid state laser system, on a ground vehicle that you can roll around and actually engage. That's a very significant point, and, it, and it's a knowledge point moving forward to the 100 kW. Uh, talking about energies, you know, we, we have our requirement, my graphical training aid. This is our requirement now. Um, and it means a lot of things have to arrive at one short period of time, and we have to kill all of those. So the system is sized to, along with the force structure, a, a platoon, uh, a company, whatever we're going to field in the IBCS world, I mean the I, IFTC world, uh, along with the power required to engage those targets. More power means you less, you less dwell time on a target. So if you want to engage more targets, you have a higher power. We're not just arbitrarily picking a number. So again, 50 is very significant, and it, it leads into the next piece. Uh, we're also doing a technology integration um, uh, initiative uh, program, basically putting a 50 kW system into, uh, into a striker-sized vehicle. Again, that again shows that you can m move the swap. You can move this uh, capability. You've already got the laser available. Uh, once the funding rolls in for that particular piece of it, we'll then have a very significant uh, maneuver capability that we'll be, uh, that we'll be able to demonstrate. The third piece of this um, is really kind of like using the, uh, the, the field handling trainer. You know, if we had the perfect system right now and we, we held it out and gave it to our soldiers, they wouldn't know exactly how to use it. So the next initiative is to take a low power laser, uh, the 5KW that the, the boss was talking about, that's MIHEL, it's a mobile experimental high energy laser, and we've, we've uh, integrated that, that laser in there. I, I, I should say we've bolted it in. I mean, it's not fully integrated, but it's a demonstrator. We've given it to soldiers. They fired it at MFIX. They fired it out at uh, the fire center, uh, and it's now over in Europe, uh, and we'll be participating in some exercises over there. 
we're learning a lot of things there. But again, going back to the team sport, you, you, if you look at YouTube, the Navy has recently put lasers on ships. And we've learned some things on how they employ those, and, and we're bringing those back over to the program. And they're bringing along technologies that we can do that. There, there are still challenges, though. So it, given those three prongs, we're trying to address some of those challenges. The first is operational. Uh, you, if you, all the naysayers from 5, 10, 15 years ago say, well, you can't, you know, in a 100-mile-an-hour sandstorm, you can't shoot a laser. Well, that's true, but what are you shooting at in a 100-mile-an-hour sandstorm? And we're trying to address those concerns. Uh, I would tell you we've had to go off and shoot in the rain because people say you can't kill things with a laser in the rain. But guess what? You can kill things with a laser in the rain. If you can see it, you can kill it, and you can have an effect on it. You're going to degrade the effect. Again, if the more power you have, the better that effect will, uh, will create. So, again, twice as much power, you can have twice, uh, about twice the capability in, the, in a, a degraded atmosphere. So weathers, weather TTPs, we give it to our soldiers so they can try it out, integrate it into a formation, you know, ask us questions because we the, the next thing we're building is a full dot mil PFT uh, to go along with just giving a, giving a laser, even though that's, that's there. Uh, there's still technology I issues. I mean, we have a laser source. 100 kW is very, is very significant. Uh, we, again, we'd like to have a couple sources that are av available from a couple manufacturers, and I think we're walking down that path right now. Uh, that way we have other you know, specific uh, applications that we can address with different technologies. Swap. You know, the, the Army has the most uh, difficult problem because we have us there in, in the Marine Corps. We have small vehicles that we're trying to put the same thing in that you would put into a large aircraft or put into a, a, a ship or something like that. Uh, so swap is very important. We're seeing the laser itself, the engine, get down to the point where perhaps that's the line replaceable unit. In the old days, the, uh, the, you know, that, was, that was some big piece of the laser, and you had to tear it open, and you got uh, you know, exposure to sand and dust and, and atmosphere. Well, what if all we have to do now is just replace the laser? And that, it, that becomes the smallest piece. Uh, that's kind of where we're, we're tracking with these fiber optic lasers <coughs> that, are, uh, that are totally modular. Uh, target acquisition and track is extremely important. With a laser system, you need either a really, really good radar system and an, and an okay optical system because you've got to do aim point. Or you need a really, really good optical system. Or you do the system engineering to get halfway between those. Lethality is important. Uh, a, lot of our, um, a, lot of, a lot of the naysayers say, well, there's all these sorts of countermeasures out there. You know, we have a full up uh, countermeasure program that demonstrates lethality against all of these different targets that we're going against. But you've got to know what the aim point needs to be. You, you, you know, there's maybe blowing up the gas tank on a, a UAV isn't the best approach. Perhaps it's cutting off uh, one of the struts makes the thing uh, die. Against a very, very small target, um, you know, these little drones that we're worried about dropping bombs and things like that, you know, laser may be the only thing that we have to engage it in a short period of time. So lethality is extremely important. And then finally, there still are manufacturing issues. Uh, it, it's good to say that we can build one now and we can demonstrate one now. The uh, industrial base for gimbaled um, optical systems, you know, it, it exists out there, but it hasn't been applied necessarily to the, the, uh, the laser type system. So again, things like diodes, we got these are diode pumped uh, systems. We need uh, U.S. manufacturers that uh, build diodes so we can uh, we can pump these things and the optics that go along with it. So uh, again, to address it, uh, three three prongs, three approaches now going from the, the bottom end of giving a soldier a low-powered laser uh, and to see what happens when, you, when, they can, when they can do that, all the way to a, a, a very step-by-step -step process that allows us to get to the 100 kW or uh, higher energy laser levels that will be very operationally effective. Okay. Thanks, Rick. And finally, Joe, Secretary of Defense Mattis speaks to how the need to deliver capability at the speed of relevance is essential today. What is industry doing or what can industry do to meet that objective? So this is a great reminder of what our uh, combatant commanders uh, are really challenging uh, our military leaders, our civilian leaders, and frankly the defense industry uh, to help them with. Uh, because on one hand, we want to ensure that we've got the disciplined approach to acquiring the best capabilities that we, uh, that we can possibly deliver to our soldiers. But on the other hand, uh, we have to recognize the fact that our adversaries are spinning out capabilities very fast, and they are incrementally increasing the gap uh, that we've all recognized exists. So how do we preserve uh, 
the process that we're using to deliver these 21st century capabilities, but not at the risk of the near-term possibility that our warfighters are going to go to battle uh, in the near term. And there's a couple of things I think that are working very well. I think the SCO and the RCO that the, uh, the Army has stood up uh, are organizations that are challenging industry uh, to find those spin-out solutions. Uh, I think the, the multi-domain battle theme uh, that industry has embraced in taking existing capabilities and determining how we might be able to expand those existing capabilities to help a combatant commander in the multi-domain solution uh, are things that we're doing well. I'm particularly excited with the uh, Modernization Command and the CFTs. Uh, here's an organization uh, that as it stands up will be empowered to take that prudent risk that we've talked about that is needed in order to spin out capabilities to the warfighter uh, in a way that is not reckless uh, to the organization. The last thing that I would, I would offer to, uh, to the group here is that we're not the only ones in this situation. As I travel around the world uh, meeting with our combatant commanders wearing the U.S. uniform, but also meeting with our international partners, uh, we have an international community who also is trying to move it to, at the speed of relevance. There are theaters that are waking up after decades of, uh, of a peace dividend and realizing that they're behind the power curve. There's other theaters that every night they go to bed thinking tomorrow could be the day that war starts. Uh, and there's other theaters that have been at war as long as we have and, in fact, are engaged with the enemy today uh, in that air and missile defense portfolio that we're talking about. Every one of them is a potential partner and a potential investor in real-time, near-term capabilities that we can all benefit from. I think that that's an op there, there's a, an audience out there that we really haven't completely embraced that if we locked arms with, like we are in fighting wars, but if we could lock arms with them in the development of capabilities, we can push this noodle a lot faster and a lot further than we are doing by ourselves uh, the way we currently are organized. Thanks. Okay, from the floor, and I'll just throw this one up, Barry, it's probably more to you, uh, IBCS. It is key to integrated air and mi missile defense as we go forward in the future. Current IOC is FY22. Recent success on the tests uh, make one ask, could we accelerate it? Is it only a matter of money, or is there a technology challenge? So that's a great question. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what needs to be done between now and initial operational capability. Um, and so what we've demonstrated so far is the integration of IBCS with Patriot post-deployment bill version 7 software. That is the software that existed at the time we were going through the test program. Obviously, you just heard even me talk about we've already begun to fill the latest version of Patriot software, which is post-deployment bill version 8. So obviously the combatant commanders, uh, you know, need the additional capability. Uh, there are some unique uh, capabilities in that latest version of Patriot software that we want to be able to take advantage of inside of IBCS. So integrating the latest version of the Patriot software, the latest version of the Sentinel software, because we continue to make improvements uh, over time in that software. We also are still operating off of the original hardware that we bought sort of back in the 2010 time frame when we started uh, the engineering manufacturing development program. So all of our servers, uh, routers, switches, all those kind of things are uh, in, in intensive need of upgrading. Uh, and so actually we have begun to do that hardware purchase to refresh the hardware and to get it into a production representative set of hardware uh, that we will then take back through another limited user test uh, that, well, before even that, the developmental testing uh, with those latest versions of sensor and shooter software, uh, and, and then through a limited user test, back through a milestone C initial uh, operational test and evaluation. So could it be accelerated? Uh, one of the things that we looked at, obviously, is uh, in restructuring the program. There were uh, several different factors in that, so bring in the opportunity to bring in indirect fire protection capability in as another shooter into the network. So the integration of that is also sequenced in uh, with the revised program schedule. Um, so opportunities to accelerate, it, it's always kind of a risk uh, kind of discussion. So how much testing is good enough? Um, 
We actually, as we revised those two programs and laid the programs flat in terms of the latest versions of Patriot software, Sentinel software, and the indirect fire protection capability uh, system, uh, is building in additional time for test, analyze, fix test. So as we experience some of those things General Hyten talked about where you have less than satisfactory test results, you build time into the schedule to go find out exactly what those issues are, correct them before you go do the next test. So best case world, we do our the finalization of our uh, software development program, get it out there, test it, it works perfectly first time, you have great opportunity to accelerate the program because then obviously we've built uh, time into the schedule as risk for uh, you know correction of, of uh, failures that we find in, in ongoing tests. So obviously I, I always believe there's opportunities for acceleration. Uh, I don't think budget is holding us back. Uh, there may be sequencing type things um, as we go through this deliberate developmental test program and other limited user tests, if we see those opportunities are there, obviously there may need to be some rephasing uh, of funding to make sure that we have some production funding up early enough to, to actually get the hardware in place that we can field on an accelerated basis. But uh, obviously I always believe there's there, those opportunities to bring things faster. Okay, let me put this one out there. Cyber is a threat that's preeminent today, we're all software dependent systems. What are we doing to build resiliency in to our systems and are we leveraging and collaborating with Cybercom? I'll throw that one out to anybody. It was addressed to IBCS specifically, but. Well, I think Colonel Wines actually brought it up in terms of, and I'll just tag on to that. So a lot of the um, tabletop exercises, the adversarial assessments, our own internal development process, we're exposing our systems um, to various kinds of attacks, uh, not just limited to cyber, but uh, all kinds of electronic attacks, all other kind of vulnerabilities that we harden our systems against as a part of the development process. Obviously, we have a lot of great work uh, ongoing um, in labs and at test ranges. I won't get real specific, but I can tell you that we are exposing our systems in labs uh, with virtual hardware uh, to the point of destruction. We don't actually want to corrupt any of our real tactical hardware, so we do some of that in labs. And then I can tell you we are exposing our systems at test ranges to real operational threats. Uh, all of the things that you mentioned that would be uh, potential vulnerabilities or access points to our systems. So I can tell you we're paying attention to it. We are investing in it. Um, Congress is supporting that investment. We received several congressional ads over a period of time uh, to be able to get after that. Um, a, a system like Integrated Air and Missile Defense Battle Command System, uh, you want to be able to do that integration that General Hyten talked about, not just from a defensive posture, but ultimately from an offense and defense posture to enable our combatant commanders with uh, additional capability. Every time you broaden the scope of what's included in that span of control, you have to make sure that we're doing the right things to uh, harden our systems. So I won't get real specific. I will just tell you, though, that we are making the investments and we are exposing our systems to those kind of threats. We're learning as we go. I'll just tell you that um, I, I, it's a statement of the obvious, but we're in a cyber war now, I mean, every day. I mean, this should not be a surprise to anybody. <laughs> this is an ongoing conflict, has been for quite a while, and so it behooves all of us to make sure that we're doing the right things for our systems. I'll leave it to any other panel members. Just just as a comment from a warfighter perspective, uh, I, I tell you, we, we're taking the lead. Uh, General Dickinson has talked about it a bit. Uh, setting up, uh, picking up warfighter ownership of these systems and making sure we partner with uh, the PEO and with MBA so that, uh, you know, not just the, the technical side of cyber, but also the, uh, the user side of it. I mean, the most obvious cyber attack is an insider attack. A guy forgets his badge and makes it into the, to the area. So we're, we're pushing hard in those areas and, and uh, partnering with our cyber, standing up cyber uh, protection teams uh, to support all of our uh, very important systems. With respect to cruise missile and cruise missile defeat, can somebody give us an update on our initiatives specific to that threat set, be it sensor, be it interceptor? 
So uh, again, the indirect, I didn't do a job, great job explaining, but the indirect fire protection capability, really the first block is prioritized around cruise missile defense and counter UAS defense, really some of the larger UASs. I mean, the current things we're doing in counter UAS are against some of the really small commercial off the shelf um, type systems. So the indirect fire protection capability system, its initial block of capability really is to do, um, as opposed to having Patriot be the single solution for every particular threat that we see out there. We really need some additional effectors on the battlefield. So indirect fire protection capability with the initial AIM-9X missile is that initial cruise missile defense capability at less than and lower than Patriot costs and to be more widely proliferated than Patriot. The insertion of directed energy technologies over time um, I think play in that realm as well both in maneuver shore ad as well as in, as uh, Rick mentioned, in indirect fire protection capability. So we're tightly linked with uh, General Dickinson's organization with Rick and the technology developers, Tom Weber, uh, Kip Kendrick, all the rest of the team at SNBC that are really pushing the directed energy, the high energy uh, laser path forward. Now we'll just say there are other directed energy kind of technologies out there as well. Um, you know, that obviously are of interest over time. So um, really on the sensor suite, I would say the, the big thing there is um, some of the software upgrades that I talked about that we do over time for our current fleet of sensors. I think also the Army owns other sensors, other ground-based radars, so does the Air Force and Marine Corps, that while I talked about IBCS just in terms of integration of Army sensors, uh, there's great opportunity. We work very hard with the Air Force and Marine Corps to make sure that the A kit, the adaptation kit uh, that goes inside any sensor or shooter is a government controlled interface control. We can provide that to anybody. We have provided it to the Air Force, for example, for their three dealer radar. So we fully intend and have growth paths to integrate all kind of sensors to help us deal with the air threat. The other piece being just as we've done counter UAS and counter rocket artillery and mortar, the Army owns a lot of sensors to do counter battery, uh, Q Q53, counter target acquisition radars, um, uh, lightweight counter mortar radars. So the adaptation and integration of other battlefield sensors that the Army has, some of the experimental sensors that I mentioned from from AMARDEC that have a great 360 degree low cost surveillance uh, capability that we're looking to integrate with IBCS as fast as possible. All of those really contribute to uh, advancing uh, air defense, the air piece of uh, air, air and missile defense. Shifting to man pads. Um, as we field man pads, it was, was mentioned that we've stood up man pads teams, non-dedicated in Europe. What capability have we given those teams for command and control and to get early warning to them? So I, I think just from a legacy perspective, again, um, you know, the, somebody mentioned, uh, I don't remember, I think it was General Dickinson had a slide up on Tobruk Legacy, and so we're heavy players in Tobruk Legacy. And so when you look at our current currently fielded command and control system is something called Ford Area Air Defense Command and Control, FAD C2. That is the C2 system that works with Avenger and Stinger uh, and, and is uh, one of the critical pieces for executing those joint and allied uh, exercises like Tobruk Legacy. And so uh, as a start point, that, that's where we are. Obviously, as a part of this strategy you see behind me, in the collapse to or the integration or synchronization of this new integrated fire control system called IBCS, we look at uh, leveraging the capability that's already resident in FAD C2, which has been used traditionally for air defense, also is used for counter rocket artillery mortar and is the foundation for counter unmanned aerial surveillance system. All that is inherited in to the IBCS capability. Sir, if I could, and just uh, across a couple of the last questions, uh, and I won't get into any specific details, but I think uh, these are, are 
gaps that we've all identified that exist with our U.S. warfighting uh, organizations, but those are also gaps that existed uh, worldwide with international partners. And, and from an industry perspective, while our number one partner and customer has always been the U.S., uh, over the course of the last decade, we have been working with international partners to address the very kinds of threats that we're talking about today, and those technologies have advanced. Now, they've advanced on the behalf of the international partner and what it is that they're trying to do, but this is not as uh, gloom and doom a story as some people may, may uh, make it out to be. The truth is, is how do we get ourselves to embrace uh, some of the investment and some of the development that's been occurring over the last decade for threat sets that we would have acknowledged uh, during the early 2000s, but we had other priorities. Uh, but the development of those capabilities has progressed over time, and now it's how do we bring that all together uh, in real time, in near term, uh, to provide those solutions for the U.S. customer. So I, I think my, my real message is, is that we've identified these things. They sound really scary. They are really scary. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, as many of our international partners have been dealing with this threat, uh, they've become pretty good at it. Uh, and we have facilitated the development of those solutions. So we ought to have the, the flexibility to be able to take what we've learned and, and insert that into the, the warfighting capabilities that exist today. I would just tag on one. I thought the question was going to go in a different place in terms of additional capabilities inside the Stinger uh, system. That's itself. the next question, Barry, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I skipped over You used that the word legacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's got a springboard. So obviously there's a lot we're doing to upgrade our current systems. I mean, uh, in terms of speed to relevance, in terms of warfighting capability for our combatant commands, generally speaking, you can do things that are evolutionary much faster than you can do next generation modernization things against those really difficult future threats. So obviously there's an ongoing process to spin additional capability into our existing systems, Patriot PDB-8, MSC, um, but even in Stinger, uh, something as simple as adding proximity fuses to, to, to deal with unmanned aerial systems. So we've gone through a qualification program to actually uh, qualify uh, proximity fuse inside of Stinger. And so as we're doing a service life extension program for Stinger, Stinger missiles for the U.S. Army and for the Marine Corps, our, our allied partners, if they tend to join, we can actually insert new technology into that Stinger missile to make it relevant to some of the UAS threats of today. You have something you want to add, Rick? Or? Okay. No, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, just as a, as a data point, the CFT, the IAMD CFT is right now down in Huntsville reviewing proposals and ways to, to uh, provide additional capabilities across these systems. Okay. This is one over to, to Rob Lyon. I think uh, do we anticipate the ad program will evolve, evolve and transition or transfer from MDA to the Army and go into a sustainment? Uh, so we've been, we've been discussing this for, for several years between um, the, the Army and MDA. Um, there's, there's congressional language out there in the 2018 NDAA uh, that, that indicates programs that have reached uh, a milestone C or milestone C equivalent because uh, MDA doesn't uh, operate uh, uh, by, by JSID's definitions um, that will we'll transfer. Um, th those discussions are, are ongoing uh, at, at, at this point. Um, and so not only with the Army, but we're also working through those same uh, transition and transfer discussions with the Navy for, for those systems, particularly the SM3 Block Block 1B uh, that has entered full production. So there's there's different models on, on how that could be uh, transferred. And I, I think at this point, we're, we're still early on in, in the discussion phases with the Army um, to see if that's if that's um, the right path to, to go down. So. Yeah. Mr. DeFada, are we actively leveraging academic institutions as we work uh, with directed energy? Any formal programs, or is it all informal? Well, in that industry and the academic institutions that, that specialize in directed energy are integrated into our joint process, the answer is yes. Uh, and we also actively pursue through our BAAs and other things 
new technologies. On the academic side, it's generally new technologies. What's the next laser that we should be developing? What's the next capability as opposed to trying to weaponize the current technology where we are right now? So I, it's, I would say it's more informal than formal, uh, but we do have direct interaction with, uh, with all of the houses that do this stuff for a living. Okay, with respect to our NATO partners and, and, and NATO initiatives, as the Army moves forward with mo its modernization, how are we envision bringing the allies along? So that's a great question. I'll take a stab at it. So obviously inside Europe, as others were referring to, um, uh, they've been dealing in an environment now where they are concerned about uh, some of the threats they're faced with. Um, and so obviously the, the foreign military sales, there's a lot of emphasis and initiative in that arena. Um, a number of NATO countries that are looking to buy IBCS, Patriot, uh, a lot of our short-range systems, and a lot of our strike systems as well, our, our offensive systems. So I think there's great opportunity there in the, in the NATO community um, to, to partner uh, with, uh, with our current systems and then uh, even some of our uh, forward-looking systems. So, so we should have... Uh, I think some of you, most of you have probably seen a lot of the press releases on the, the, uh, the pace of progress that we're making with Poland uh, in terms of Integrated Air Missile Defense Battle Command System and Patriot. There are a number of other uh, countries that are interested in those integrated type capabilities. So just from the strict foreign military sales uh, perspective, there's great opportunity there. And then the, the joint exercises, I think, that we mentioned earlier, you know, really uh, flexing uh, I tell you, the 10th AAMDC, Greg Brady, I've seen him here earlier. He's at Headquarters VA now. But um, he, he really uh, led the way, I think, in reinvigorating a lot of the operational experimentation uh, with our European partners. Uh, and certainly Colonel Jen Eikhoff was supposed to be here on our panel uh, today as well. Unfortunately, she got sick and wasn't able to travel. But uh, she carried that banner on from the 10th AAMDC perspective in Europe. Uh, and did a lot of miraculous things in terms of, uh, of bringing coalition NATO partners together to execute these uh, large maneuvers. Okay. Let me from, and, uh, throw this one out to the panel, but maybe, Sean, you're probably the right guy. As we think of multi-domain battle, how do we see our air and missile defense organizations and our systems uh, integrating into that modern strategy? Thanks, sir. The uh, first and last question, I believe, uh, looking at the time, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap it up within this time frame. Uh, as, as you know, uh, USERPAC is really leading the charge on the multi-domain battle uh, concept and has, has put a lot of work in and working closely uh, with the CFPs on capability that can be integrated. And obviously, a natural fit is the integrated air and missile defense portfolio because, you know, I, I argue that in the uh, PACOM AOR, we're, we're already demonstrating the uh, multi-domain uh, battle concept. And essentially, as you break it down, uh, the, the concept evolves around uh, sensor shooter agnostic, uh, regardless of uh, service, to be able to put, uh, you know, steel on target uh, from any component of the joint force. So if you look at what we're doing right now with Army A and Tippy 2 radars, uh, queuing Aegis BMD ships, and even launching on remote, you're already demonstrating elements of the multi domain battle are right there. So, as you integrate other systems, I believe it's the build the architecture and essentially the system shooter architecture where you have an automated system in the loop as opposed to an, an air defense fire control officer in the loop. You build that architecture is irregardless of the system that's integrated into that system. As the systems come on board, we'll continue to integrate as we're integrating the AM to B2, uh, the Aegis BMD ship, that, or any other components to that. Rick? I, I have to add at this point, uh, we are very heavily um, vested in the PACOM uh, multi-domain main battle experiment and across the Army. And one of the things that the Army is doing now is formally recognizing special capabilities, and it's the opportunity to talk a little bit about space, but 
we're creating actually a, an organization that integrates, it's called an IQ's battalion, it uh, includes uh, intel, cyber, electronic warfare, and space in a single organization, uh, recognizing that all of those, uh, those equities are integrated in the, in the current battle, uh, not so well, in the future battle has to be there, the first, the first uh, uh, fire may not be anything that's kinetic. And so th this experiment is really important to bringing space capabilities along with the other integrated electronic warfare and those kinds of things uh, to an experiment, and uh, that may go across the Army. Okay. And I got one question left. Barry, you're probably the guy, and if you can't answer it, I will. Okay. In the FY18 plus-up that the Army got of approximately $6.5 billion, what portion of it went to air and missile defense? I don't know if I can break it down that far. Uh, the, uh, I know as far as the enhanced budget, uh, there was an additional $1.3 billion that was added into my portfolio. Uh, out of that $1.3 billion, I don't remember exactly how much would have been uh, air and missile defense. A lot of that uh, you know, was for increased capacity, uh, uh, additional shooters, um, you, you know, uh, additional strike options. There was some in there for air and missile defense, but I don't have the, the lower level. But it wasn't yeah. enough, right? Thank it you. wasn't enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I will just say uh, before we wrap up, now that we got seven seconds, uh, I'd be remiss. Uh, Colonel DeFada brought it up. Rick DeFada brought it up. Now FDS DeFada. But, uh, so I'm General, not insulted. Yeah. So General Thurgood is back from Afghanistan. We're, we're glad to have him back. So. Um, Great partner now at uh, Missile Defense Agency, uh, uh, back from a forward location, and we're very glad that, uh, that he's back with us safe and sound and appreciate the work that you did while you were gone supporting our soldiers and staying in close contact back with all the folks here. Glad to have you back. Sure. Turn it back over to you, General Ham. Thank you very much. Thanks, Fran, and thanks to, to a great panel to get us kicked off on, a, on a discuss the great discussion of capabilities. I was reminded, and Howard, why don't you bring your panel on up? I was reminded as they were talking, uh, I, many, many moons ago, I, I began my service as an infantry paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division, trained as a red-eye gunner. We've, we've kind of come a long way since, uh, since those days, so pretty... Uh, very, very important as we as we move forward. So thank you again for a, for a great panel discussion. So moving on from uh, from capabilities, the next panel was going to talk with us about about uh, capacity uh, and provide sufficient uh, air missile defense capacity to meet what seems to be an insatiable and ever increasing demand. Uh, so we'll grab this panel together. The panel moderator for this is Lieutenant General uh, retired uh, Howard Bromberg, United States Army. And now the Vice President and Deputy for Strategy and Business Development, Air and Missile Defense at Lockheed Martin. Howard, off to you and your panel. So uh, good, good morning, everybody, and why the panel's uh, just about set here. I'll do a quick, the way we're going to do this uh, for the next hour or so is uh, I'll do just a short introduction of the panel members, and then we're going to do more traditional uh, of each, each panel member will go down and, uh, and give a short uh, introductory comment, and then, uh, and then after that we'll, we'll be taking the questions while you all are, are thinking of them. And please uh, be much more rich discussion if, uh, for the great questions that you'll have. So uh, before I get started, you know, it's just kind of interesting. We're going back in the earlier uh, discussion, and we were looking about uh, developmental items, and you hear General Hyten talk this morning about speed of development, and and I, and I hear the discussion about Shorad in Europe, and we're pulling Avengers to do different things, and if you, so we should all recall how Avenger was developed. It was a non-develop at that time. It was called the non-developmental item program, and as I remember, this was being in the Army G3 at the time in force development with. Uh, and how quickly we developed Avenger, and we did it with good enough. Because if you remember when we deployed it in 1990 for uh, Desert Shield and Desert Storm, we didn't even have coolant units in it at that time. And that was one of the big complaints. You see the guys driving with the, with the glass up because it was so darn hot. And here it is 25 plus years later, 
we're taking a non-developmental item and we're going to mod it again and put it out. So there is some things about what's good enough and how fast enough. And so I just kind of bring that back as a historical point. It's kind of an interesting thing uh, now that we look back over that time, how that effort and how fast it went, how it still yields us benefits today. So, so with that, let me just go ahead and start off, and I'll do, as I said, a quick introduction. I think you'll see our panel today, what was tried to do is, a, is have not just an Army panel, so we do have multiple services represented. We have Navy as well as Air Force and Army. So you should have a pretty broad perspective as well as an operational commander, as well as also the Department of the Army staff. So hopefully we'll be able to give you the breadth of discussion as we go to today. So let me start with, uh, uh, to my right, uh, Dan Klipstein, serves as uh, Deputy Director of Army Strategy, Plans, and Policy Director. He's responsible for developing the Department of the Army strategic policies and plans to influence national and defense strategies and to generate Army development of major activities and programs. Specific focus areas, obviously, is air missile defense is one, but also war plans to combatant commanders, defense planning scenarios, and all those things that influence the future force structure and capabilities. And he also, an additional uh, role, because it's kind of interesting, we had General Hyten here this morning, provides oversight of the Army's nuclear and countering WMD agency. And then to, uh, uh, to Dan's right, we have Colonel Greg Brady. He serves as the Fires Division Chief within the Army G35, Strategy Plans and Policy Director. He's responsible for developing, integrating, and synchronizing and prioritizing the Army's position on all the fires issues. And basically, these are, these are some classic words that can only come out of the Army staff. He's a short order cook working a 24 hour, in a 24-hour diner. And for those that are in the Army staff, you know how, you, you know how that goes. Uh, last two assignments before coming great back to the building is the 10th AAMCD Commander and USER and Deputy Commander for 32nd and Forcecom. And then uh, we got Kate okay, Carolyn to the right there, Carolyn Birchfield, uh, Director of Fires and G8 on the Army staff, responsible for both the Air Missile Defense and Fire Support Portfolio. Prior to this assignment, she served as Director of Operations J3 at JFCC, uh, Functional Component Command for IMD, and commanded at Fort Bliss, uh, Texas before that. Okay, and then to her right, okay, Brigadier General Tim Sheriff, uh, current operational commander of the 263rd Army Air Missile Defense Command. And prior to that, he served a three-year tour as the DCG National Guard at the Fire Center of Excellence with Fort Sill and, and has a total of 37 years service as a career defender. So great to have you here along as well. And then uh, starting our joint perspective here to right is uh, Ken Todorov, Vice President Northrop Grumman, where he runs profit and loss business focus on the company's missile defense solutions. Ken retired from the Air Force in 2015 and was previously the Deputy Director of the Missile Defense Agency as well as serving as Director of JAMDO. Thanks for being here, appreciate it. And finally, right, rounding out our joint team, there's Arch, uh, Rear Admiral Arch Macy. Uh, it retired uh, from the U.S. Navy, obviously. This is a consultant on national defense and homeland defense, uh, homeland security issues, particularly in the areas of integrated air missile defense strategy, systems, and programs. He served as a surface warfare officer at sea on multiple ships and ashore as a weapons systems engineer, acquisition professional, and as commander of the Navy's surface ship research and engineering centers. Last assignment was director of the uh, Joint Integrated Air Missile Defense Organization on the Joint Staff. So great panel, and I think we'll, what you'll see today as we go through, we'll hopefully give you the breadth of this topic today, and then we'll look forward to your questions. So no, uh, start sending the questions up anytime you have them ready. Okay, so Dan, over to you. I guess it's on. Uh, so it looks, I just want to take a moment to open up a couple of comments, uh, just talk a little bit about the strategic environment, where we are at their missile defense, and um, just kind of set this, the table, if you will. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to address uh, the air missile defense leadership in the community. Uh, many of you are from leaders of the past, uh, many are today, and then there's, I'm sure there's some future air defense leaders out there uh, sitting in the audience right now. So as many of you are aware, our new national defense strategy has changed our focus with a return to great power competition. Specifically, the strategy states, we face an ever more lethal and disruptive battlefield combined across domains and conducted at speed, increasing speeds and reach from close combat throughout overseas theaters and reaching to our homeland. Additionally, it states that long-term strategic competition with China and Russia are the principal priorities for the department and require both increased and sustained investment because of the magnitude of the threat they pose to the U.S. security and prosperity today and the potential for those threats to increase in the future. As such, it directs us to be able to compete, deter, and, and uh, win alongside our allies and partners 
to prevail in conflict and preserve peace through strength. This transition, this transition of the strategic environment and a clear-eyed assessment of the threats that we face today and tomorrow is having an impact across all services and places an increased importance on the Army's ability to provide air and missile defense to our joint force. As many of you know ha and have experienced, the Army accepted risk over the past two decades, in part because we expected that we would continue to enjoy air dominance that we've had for the past 50 plus years. As we now trade off, we need to begin to look at adding maneuver shore ad and other capabilities. And as we did, as we did that transition, we traded off those, those capabilities and we need to buy them back. And we also canceled multiple programs as part of that assumption. It is clear that as we survey the strategic environment and assess our strategic competitors, they have effectively gone to school on our way of war. By this time, we have not one, but two near-peer competitors who are providing and developing formidable anti-access area denial capabilities and an integrated air defense systems. This complicates our ability to be both expeditionary and it holds our joint force at risk and increases our reliance on and replaces the reliance on Army air defense capabilities. Given this focus on a return to great power competition, not only is, our, is additional capability required, but the capacity needed to it, it needs to be improved as well across all air and missile defense mission areas. We must continue to field a more lethal, credible deterrent to support the defense strategy and its global operating model when you consider it the four layers of contact, blunt, surge, and homeland. During the most recent risk assessment, air and missile defense was rated as one of the most critical areas to be addressed. Our war gaming has shown that without a strong air and missile defense force, we will be challenged to get to the close fight and we will place at risk our ability to project power. The Army Chief of Staff and the Secretary of the Army list air missile defense as the Army's number five modernization priority. And it recognizes that if we can't get to the fight, none of the other modernization priorities will matter. This clearly highlights the importance of rebuilding not only capability, but capacity now that we are re-engaged in the great power competition. As we implement the new air NDS guidance to enable a global operating model and with it a dynamic force employment, we must be alert for a COCOM demand for increased combat capable Army air defense systems across the full spectrum in order to counter ballistic and cruise missiles, unmanned aerial aircraft, rocket, mortar and artillery and fixed and rotary wing aircraft. We need to have sufficient capabilities and capacities to provide defensive capability to protect not only fixed sites, but enable our mobile forces to execute multi-domain operations to compete below the level of armed conflict, and then if required, delay, degrade, and deny adversary aggression and surge war-winning forces while managing es ex escalation and above all to defend the homeland. Our capacity today is challenged to meet anticipated warfighter needs, and this is well acknowledged. As an initial fix, we are moving to increase the tactical edge of our force by adding maneuver shore ed back into our division formations and enhance that with our indirect fire protection capability to enable us to penetrate and operate inside A2AD bubbles. As the threat capability grows more sophisticated, we need to maintain and improve not only our ballistic and cruise missile capabilities with THAAD and Patriot systems, but we must also look to the future and continue to evolve these capabilities and capacities to be both more efficient and more survivable. Our senior Army leadership has recognized the gaps that we have and has addressed these gaps as a top priority, as I've said. But we all know it will take some time to fix these shortfalls. But rest assured, we're moving in that direction. If you saw the closing uh, uh, ceremonies of the Olympics, you saw, that the, you saw the drones that were, were positioned there. If 300 drones can silently assemble to create a friendly, waving white tiger mascot in the sky, just imagine what, the less, what less friendly uses our adversaries have and what they will show us in the future and how we must be prepared to, to uh, counter those. As we look past today's threats and begin to address tomorrow from hypersonic glide vehicles to early release submunitions, the swarming UAVs and other threats, we must ensure that we build the capabilities to impose costs on our competitors, but we must also impose, but we also prioritize the necessary capacity to achieve the war-winning results 
that will place us firmly on the right side of this cost curve as opposed to the wrong side. Thank you. Oh, I'm not going to hold you to last. Huh? Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Greg Brady, and I am the short order cook, but I've got an outstanding team who helps me get the meal out, and it's all about relationships in the Pentagon. Most of you understand that. So first, I'd like to thank AUSA for uh, allowing me to come back. Uh, I've been in, in this panel before as a former commander, but now being at the headquarters department of the Army, being able to support the war fighters is a huge effort. And so a couple messages today uh, from my talk. Uh, General Bromberg, Mr. Klipstein, thanks for setting the uh, stage, especially uh, Mr. Klipstein for highlighting the national defense strategy. Um, because uh, we're going to hear a lot of insights today and what this means to AMD capacity. Uh, Carol and Birchfield and I work closely to together. Uh, and this is like another day at work for us. Uh, she's in the G8, I'm in the G3. Uh, we've got some members from the ASALT team here. Uh, but a lot of effort is, and one of our top priorities is on air and missile defense. Uh, but I don't need a lot of time to convince this crowd on that. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, COCOM demands. You heard from General Hyten on the threat. But there's been other documents out there that have highlighted the need, external to the Army, on the importance of air and missile defense. The first one, some of the participants on the panel and in the audience of the National Commission on the Future of the Army about the shortage of our air and missile defense forces, missile defense, and specifically our short-range air defense. And I know General Sheriff's going to talk a little bit on that later. But also a national defense strategy calling out the integration of missile defense, but more so a layered missile defense. And I think that's a very important term. Uh, we've highlighted the threat, but also the Senate um, Armed Services Committee Chairman, uh, Senator McCain, had published a paper, the American uh, Firepower, Restoring American Power. And two of the things he specifically highlight when you look across all the services, and these were recommendations for the defense budget. One of them was a prioritization for the modernization of our AMD munitions and also developing a highly maneuverable short-range air defense system. And so we heard about that in the last panel. But all these documents, when you put them together, really have two key messages. And it's one is we've got to enhance the modernization for our AMD forces, but also increase AMD capacity. And the first thing, we talk modernization of key capabilities. The National Defense Strategy specifically highlights we will make targeted, disciplined increases in personnel and platforms to meet key capability and capacity needs. It's very important as we look at that. And I would tell you, modernization capabilities, we, air defense ranks number five. And so what does that mean? So I, I direct you to a different venue just a couple months ago when the Chief of the Staff of the Army spoke at the AUSA convention. I believe it was 10 October during the Eisenhower luncheon. And he highlighted the five or the six different capabilities. And he started with number one being long range precision fires, next combat generation vehicle, uh, third being vertical lift, and four being on the network. And then he goes in and says, none of these matter. And why? In direct quote, he said, none of these matter if you're dead. That is why you need air missile defense to protect the force. And so, and he followed up quickly with another statement that the Air Missile Defense Force has tragically atrophied over the last decade. So what are we doing now to improve that air missile defense capacity? I'll tell you, for the Patriot Force, we have now deployed, we talked about this two years ago, the Dismounted Patriot Information Coordination Central, which is going to give a battery additional capacity. It won't require a battalion mission command element, a command and control piece. So now we can do more with one battalion, increase the battle space. Uh, additionally, we've invested in a formal test detachment. So no longer taking a Patriot Battalion, because when we look at the modernization efforts with IBCS and some of the other programs Mr. Pike highlighted, now with a formal test detachment, we'll be able to take that Patriot Battalion and put it back into the operational force. So two key areas there with one of, you know, the, the big workhorse for the Army right now, which is the Patriot Missile System. But now you've heard about bringing back Shorad. I'd always like to say, making Shorad great again. And we've talked about the man pads piece to uh, maneuver units uh, in quite a bit of detail. But the proximity fuse, that's an area where we're taking legacy systems and improving that capability and expanding beyond the rotary wing and fixed wing, but now going after the unmanned aerial systems. 
we have an Avenger battery from the Army National Guard working with the uh, Armored Brigade Combat Team of our rotational force. First time happening now in Europe. But you're also changing culture now of understanding, bringing back that air missile defense capability. And Air Defense Brigade headquarters rotating Europe. You heard about that earlier as well. So continue to build capacity within our ASCCs. And then also, Carol and I have been working together over the last, really, two years uh, with the Maneuver Shore Act and indirect fire protection capability, two different systems that we do need because you're not going to have one magic bullet, one silver bullet to take care of all these threats, which goes back to my earlier point on why layered defense is so important. We're reinvigorating the CTCs now. Just talk to one of the Bronco elements out there, an air defender, there's six of them out there. And great news to report that we're starting to really improve our op four capabilities. Emphasis now within the brigade combat teams for the, the atom cells, that's your C2 element there, organic. That's really your only organic <coughs> air missile defense capability now. But with the uh, stingers, uh, the, excuse me, the man pad systems back within the formations and then the Avengers, this is going to provide a key capability. But more so, again, culture change of educating and training with subordinate commanders the importance of air missile defense, not only active, but our passive defense measures. And then finally, across the headquarters department of the Army, it going after the counter UAS threat. So uh, uh, my organization, uh, the uh, Fires Division, uh, was uh, officially appointed by uh, General Anderson in the last year as the lead now to synchronize and integrate all of our counter UAS efforts across the Department of the Army staff. There is not one organization that does that, so when you hear a couple question statements earlier today, like who's pulling things together? We just started doing that, and uh, obviously a huge growth area. But lastly, I've talked a lot about the AMD capacity, like the, you know, the hardware and the software, but I think to take it to the next level with AMD capacity, we've got to look at integration. That's the next level. And we spent quite a bit of time, I'd say, so I'll be brief on the Joint Force, you know, right now initiatives to uh, integrate THAAD and Patriot, THAAD and Aegis, BMD. Uh, but even more so than that, you, we've operated in joint kill chain exercises with uh, services, focusing on engagement operations. But now, and you saw the picture earlier with General Dickinson's slide brief, Roving Sands is back after almost 13 years. And why that's so important, because this was the premier ground-based air missile defense exercise in the world, in the world. You had all four services participating in it. We had our allies, at least seven different countries, uh, uh, and with their equipment operating side by side. So that's one of the reasons why General Chris Spillman and uh, Steve Burnley, Command Sergeant Major uh, Burnley from the 32nd Force Com are not here today. They're actually executing uh, roving sands right now. Uh, but I believe this exercise is going to allow us to work towards our integration in the Joint Force. And then the, la the second piece of, of the integration has got to be with our coalition, our, um, with the coalition and our allies. And this is something that's very personal to me after serving in uh, U.S. Army Europe. Uh, you've heard the, uh, the Tobruk legacy. This was an event, really, it was a grassroots effort started by the Joint Chiefs. And you know who the Joint Chiefs are? It was three... Army Chief Warrant Officers that started this, looking at how can we take different systems. And we started with the Czech Republic, uh, Slovenia, and, uh, and with the United States, and looking at you had different mission command systems, different sensors, individuals speaking different languages, different interceptors, but figuring out a way to combine this capability to establish one common tactical air picture. And where this has grown, and it shows you now another culture change on the integration piece with air missile defense in U.S. Army Europe. This uh, Tobruk legacy, over 10 nations participated, is going to be part of Sabre Guardian, which is one of the major NATO exercises this year. So great efforts there. So ladies and gentlemen, in, sum in summary, we have much more to do, but a lot of initiatives that are working very well right now. And I would go like to back to General Hyten's point, because when we talk modernization of our key capabilities, it leads to a lethal joint force. And a lethal joint force leads to readiness, which is our number one priority. And within that priority, we must ensure our AMD soldiers have the tools they need to deploy, fight, and most importantly, win 
across the entire spectrum of conflict. Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to participate on this panel in my role within the GA. What I'd like to speak to is a capacity in terms of modernizing the equipment within our air and missile defense formations. So from an AMD portfolio manager perspective, building AMD capacity and more specifically modernizing our equipment involves research and development, procure procurement and fielding of systems and equipment to our soldiers. As resources are limited to best manage the portfolio, we need to stay nested with national level strategies that we've spoken to, understand our threat environment, leverage new Army doctrine and reform, and then shape our portfolio strategy in support of the Army modernization priorities that we've spoken to. So it's really the finding the balance between fight tonight capabilities and then those emerging technologies which compete for those limited resources becomes that challenge. So the national defense strategy that we've spoken to marks a significant shift in focus from counterinsurgency operations. It also challenges us to develop a new operational concept and capabilities to win without the assured dominance in all the domains that General Dickinson spoke to from mud to space. To support this strategy, the Army is working multiple paths to include updating emerging operational concepts, acquisition reform, and then focusing our efforts within the portfolio based on those modernization priorities. The emergence of the multi-domain concept that uh, General Ganey spoke to describes how the Army as part of that joint or multinational force must operate to deter an adversary in a highly contested A2ED environment. As we've stated, our AMD forces will be part of that task force and they must be properly equipped to fight the enemy. So this multi-domain concept will challenge us to evaluate our current systems within the portfolio. You know, how can we make our systems more survivable? How can we increase lethality? How can we increase range and then defend against cyber and electronic attack? Solutions to these questions will allow us to prioritize science and technology efforts, procurement and fielding to ensure our soldiers are fielded with the most current and then the most capable AMD systems. And the vehicle to do that is the annual strategic portfolio analysis review that uh, we present to the Chief of Staff of the Army. Another path the Army is pursuing is acquisition reform to address how the Army can acquire a new capability or modernize a current one and then field it to our soldiers faster. So we've talked a little bit about the Futures Command, so I'd like to just uh, continue that discussion. So the formation of this new Futures Command is projected to be stood up with initial operating capability this coming summer. This newly formed three-star level task force will be directly responsible for mapping out options to consolidate the modernization process. Under one command, develop and deliver better solutions faster. And that's the theme that we've started with uh, General Hyten with his opening comments as well. And then for early integration of concept and, test and testing. So in addition to forming the new Futures Command, the Army has also established these cross-functional teams and is currently executing a pilot program for those. The Army Capabilities Development Acquisition Enterprise Initiative is intended to explore how we as an Army can be innovative with our industry partners and academia and how we, can we best integrate and synchronize some of these processes across multiple stakeholders at a much faster and quicker rate. The use of the designated CFT supports the authority of the Chief of Staff of the Army in the development and the approval of these requirements. So these initial CFTs consist of uh, personnel from many specialties, and those specialties inclu include requirements, acquisition, science and technology, test and evaluation, resourcing, and then also uh, members of U.S. Army Forces Command as well as Army Service Component Commands as applicable. So these CFTs also leverage industry and academia, as uh, I've stated. And most of these CFTs, and specifically our Air and Missile Defense CFT, is, uh, is the, uh, the director is a Brigadier General, and he reports directly to the Under Secretary of the Army at the direction of the Secretary of the Army, and then the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army at the direction of the Chief. The concept for the CFT is to develop a requirement informed 
in appropriate cases by the experimentation and technical demonstrations that, that Mr. Pike talked to uh, as part of his uh, presentation with the PEO missiles in space. And a total of eight CFTs were stood up as part of this pilot program. And two of those eight CFTs are within our fires portfolio, long range precision fires and then air and missile defense CFT. So, you know, within my team in uh, headquarters DAG8 fires, we have direct represent representation and membership on these two CFTs. So this allows us to stay nested with that team and then also the intent is to have that team based on the guidance that we get from senior leadership help us build the palm and that's what we are currently doing. So all of these previous efforts described support the Army, Army's uh, modernization strategy. So the Army, Army's modernization strategy has one focus and that's to uh, make our soldiers and units more lethal so they can fight and win our nation's war. Specifically, how do we balance near, mid and far term investments and that's really the key. The CSA, as we've stated, has outlined six Army modernization priorities and as uh, Greg, Greg articulated, uh, the fifth modernization priority is to modernize and then re restore our AMD systems to ensure our future combat formations are protected from modern and advanced air and missile delivery fires. And that most critical gap that's been identified and has been acknowledged by the Chief of the Staff of the Army is that uh, maneuver formations currently lack air and missile defense. So we, we have uh, many initiatives within the portfolio that are getting after that gap, beginning with uh, the Stinger teams and then also the uh, maneuver shore ad effort. So the directed requirement for that uh, capability has been signed by the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army and we expect to get a capability out to the field with a, uh, a battery in FY20 and then four battalions projected to be fielded by FY22. So it's, it's a good news story for the Army. We have the resources that are within the portfolio in order to support that. So you know, every time I, I go into an engagement with the senior leader, it's always when can we get this capability into the field and how can we go faster as we've talked about. Okay. So in addition to uh, MSHORAD, we also have other successes in terms of applying uh, the FY19 budget resources across the portfolio and I'd like to just share a few of those with you. So we, uh, within the budget, we sustain production of MSE. We've talked aloud about, uh, a lot about uh, the work that uh, General Perna in AMC has uh, done with the munitions work. So within the portfolio, we now are funded to uh, the max production of MSE missiles, 240 per year, okay? And then also, we also leverage uh, multiple uh, funding paths. So not only the base budget, but also OCO funding, you know, if applicable to get after, um, you know, that uh, munition shortfall. As uh, Greg talked to you, also we are applying a uh, service life extension program to all available Block 1 Stinger missiles. That adds the proximity fuse to improve our counter UAS uh, capability for that, uh, that missile. And then we also continue to resource Patriot modernization and then we uh, also accelerate uh, the lower tier air and missile defense and sensor. So that is now funded within, you know, within the budget. And you know, as Mr. Pike talked to, it's, it's just a matter of when that capability uh, um, will become uh, uh, into the field. And then uh, finally, uh, the FY19 uh, budget provides full support for indirect fire protection capability and uh, integrated battle command system. And uh, specifically to achieve their IOCs in 21 and 22 respectively. So in, in summary, what I'd like to just say that the Army requires sufficient and predictable funding in order to meet the requirements to build our readiness. And that's really the challenge. So with that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Check. Okay, good. I went and ate a Snickers bar on the break before the last one. I thought we had another break. That's why I was late to the podium. I had to go get my jacket, but uh, I wanted to make sure I was just as enthusiastic as Greg Brady. So I ate the Snickers bar with two pieces in it. So uh, we're going to get everybody awake here and stuff like that. General Ham, thank you for allowing the guard to come in today and, and be part of this AUSA meeting. It's huge for the force. Uh, General Dickinson, thank you for your continued leadership and, and synchronizing us at the top level in dealing with the tough issues. And particularly General Swan, our first commander, first ASCC commander, thank you for uh, continuing to reach out to the 263rd 
uh, to be part of these forums. And isn't it great to have General Bromberg back? Still got the document in, my, document in my desk. He was one of the first ones to place conferences in the 263rd AAMDC and allow us to inherit a mission that the 32nd uh, uh, codified uh, with the Homeland Defense Mission. So uh, speaking about capacity, uh, I'll take you as, as quick as I can uh, down through from the strategic to the tactical level, talking from the AAMDC down through the brigade and uh, uh, down to what we're doing our work with our battalions today. You know, uh, there was a little saying that come up as, as we started operationalizing the Guard, right, as, as the war times kicked off uh, that we've uh, lived in in the past years, and it was, this is not your grandfather's Guard. That was as it first came out. And then I got to say, well, my dad served during Korea and all. I said, this is not my dad's Guard. Well, this is not the Guard that I served in now, so it's not... It's not the guard I started out in. And the reason I say that is because uh, the contribution of the National Guard in the areas of air and missile defense have significantly changed over the years. And I believe most people in the audience has realized those changes. And it's only been through the work uh, with the active component between, as uh, Greg Brady likes to call it, Compo 1 and Compo 2. And we got some jokes about that. Uh, that, that we really were the first element as, as we tried to get out of some of those old stigmatisms to where we became one team, one fight, one air defense community. A lot of that's codified through the great soldiers today like Command Sergeant Major Dodson from the Fire Center of Excellence. He takes time to get out. And, of course, it comes down from SMDC. So the 263rd operates in a very unique theater. Uh, in the NORAD and NORTHCOM theater, a binational command across three regions, three AOCs. Uh, and over the years, uh, uh, since we have taken the mission, uh, we've got codified area air defense plans in each one of those regions. Uh, we've got uh, a very good look at what we do in our contingency plans to defend certain assets. So we're, we're pretty fit, well vested. And then, of course, we conduct the the daily contingency operation of Operation Noble Eagle. A lot of people like to prefer to the Homeland Defense Mission as the NCRI adds. I challenge you that it's much more than that. It is uh, just like as General Ganey has a portion uh, in his area of responsibility is a Homeland Defense Mission because when you dig down in to what the soldiers uh, and airmen are, are particularly are doing today within the Homeland Defense Mission, you find yourself on any given day in any state uh, within the United States proper and, and any region, uh, be it Alaska or Canada, providing surveillance support as that part of the joint engagement sequence. So we continue to evolve. A lot of the, uh, the uh, uh, purpose that we have is w found within our work with other AAMDCs. We just got back from supporting the 94th in their Exival, which was a huge opportunity to look at the uniqueness of the PACOM Theater and the challenges it faced the 94th every day. Our other sister double AMDC, the 10th double AMDC, and Colonel Shank is, is just as vital uh, to our existence of uh, supporting their realm of mission sets. So we continue to evolve and then uh, we continue to evolve, uh, uh, provide the force comm tro and tray just as the 32nd does for their forces. We uh, continue to be enabled to do that. Uh, significantly, uh, in 19, in the start of 19, we will reactivate the AAMDC as a multi-compo unit. Uh, different than the, the days when General uh, Bromberg, the early on days of the 32nd, uh, we will receive Title 10 spaces uh, that will work under the 263rd AAMDC, the commander still being a guard commander. So we're looking forward to that. That will further... Uh, enable us to touch different mission sets with authorities that, that we need. The brigades, uh, not many people realize that from a brigade footprint that what we do with the task force command and control and the NCRI adds with this uh, uh, heavily uh, responsible mission uh, for task force command and control which involves those air battle managers and those tactical directors uh, that the brigades actually have a, a separate allocation for those 44 spaces. So our brigade MTOs remain intact uh, while we're doing that mission set. So that doesn't affect our ability to, uh, to rotate as a brigade headquarters. 
I got a note uh, this morning from, uh, it was this morning my time, uh, from Colonel Rich Holy. He's just uh, mobilized the 1st Brigade Mission Command element back into Europe uh, to work for Colonel Dave Shank uh, to mission command those subordinate units under the 10th AAMBC. Very exciting if, if you want to talk uh, to the 10th about what they've got planned uh, to get this first footprint back into Europe uh, and, and establish uh, uh, the groundwork for what future will probably be a brigade headquarters, a permanent brigade headquarters in Europe. Uh, but we've got the next rotation lined up. Uh, Colonel Tom Moore's in the audience today. He's part of uh, one of the following panels. He's the task force commander. He'll, uh, he'll close up shop up here in the NCR, and he'll go back and he'll mobilize uh, the brigade arm of the 174th out of the Ohio National Guard. He'll move on over to Europe to follow Rich Holy and, and further vest the mission and lay the groundwork for 5-4 ADA, right? Lay the groundwork for the, the stand-up of the battalion uh, in Europe. Uh, some months ago, we realized that our brigades were not ready and relevant. We realized it before some months ago, but some months ago, we started to address it. And we looked at the deltas between our 14 Echoes, uh, 140 Echoes, 14 Alphas, and Adaptos. And we said, is this a problem too hard to solve because we don't have Patriot and Thad in the Guard? Yes, we have. We assess some active component officers and NCOs uh, in our ranks, uh, but our, our depth is thin with knowledge to be able to be a ready and relevant force to go in and be trusted by the Army to go in and command and control subordinate forces. So we addressed it. And we addressed it in the right kind of way with the support of SMDC, General Dickinson, uh, uh, some help there, particularly the Fire Center of Excellence, and uh, uh, General Spillman at the time, and then Randy McIntyre. Uh, we built a program, and we brought the best of the best out of the active component to set up the program. And as a result, 14 of the PACs that are going to work for uh, uh, Colonel Shank uh, have two uh, certified ASI ADAPTOs, they're some of the best air battle managers uh, for CRCs in the inventory, has a qualified 140 ECHO and 14 alphas that understand staff work when it comes to uh, upper tier and mid tier. So we're very proud of that program. Uh, as we come down through the, uh, down into the hot topic of the day, I've heard it mentioned, you know, I didn't make the little tick marks, but boy, maneuver sure Ed, what are we going to do about these formations here, these battalion formations? Well, the, the seven battalions in the National Guard have, have sort of been the main, well, have been the mainstay of the shore Ad force through uh, 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 244 and 55 doing the if pick and the C ram. And uh, we're spending right now at about a one to three four. 3.4 is our, is our spin rate on our battalions. That's with CRAM, NCRI ads. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we've just put the battery back into Europe, right? They're, they're, moving, they're moving fast. Complete training plan. The tents brought them under fold. Uh, they'll go through their final certification processes, and they'll be a viable asset of, of the ABCT in Theater 2-1 ABCT. So... Uh, we continue to evolve, but what does it mean for the future of the guard formations? As we look, as we look as being on a road to IFPIC, seven battalions of IFPIC in the 24 time frame, and we look at what's just been released for 144 strikers and what looks like four battalions uh, between 21 and 22, what does that mean to the guard? Well, right now, as the guard sets currently, we need another battalion. We need at least, uh, as we're talking, short rad, short range air defense. Uh, we're going to need another battalion just to keep up uh, with what we have on the plate in the, in the next five years. So we're going to advocate for that through these processes of talks. And we'll do uh, what the Army needs us to do with our, our shore ad strength uh, that we have today and be interested in those discussions. Our strengths, uh, those are the cha uh, a challenge, the one to three, four, what we turn in. But on an offset to that, our strength comes from the ability to keep our formation strong. We're running at over 100% strength still in our National Guard formations for these seven battalions. Nothing different than the active component. When you peel the onion back, you know, you get into the, uh, uh, what's in the accession type pipeline and, and what we actually have available for formation. But we typically run somewhere in the 82, 83%, uh, which, is, which is good. It, it's a good mark. And, and you see that from our ability to turn soldiers. Plus, we have a, 
a, a great capability within the Guard uh, to cross level between states to pick up mission sets. So uh, I'll, I'll leave you with that right there. That's sort of the Guard story for today and an update. And I appreciate your time and be glad to entertain any questions. Thank you. All right. Well, good day, everybody. Uh, it's a real honor to be here, uh, John Ham, uh, John Swan. Thanks for uh, having me me in, and um, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to give you my thoughts today. Also, I uh, want to thank my panel members, who, with whom I have a, a great deal of respect, and um, particularly glad that my friend and, and mentor of Admiral Macy is here, because without him, I would truly be the odd duck on the panel. But it's good to have the Navy guy here at the end. I actually got him to smile. It's the first time. That's good. I'm happy. I've, I've succeeded. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that General Hyten is no longer here because as an airman, you know, whenever you're around General Hyten, you feel kind of inadequate. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing always to hear his thoughts and just uh, heartening and, and to, to, to know that, uh, you know, an officer of his caliber, caliber and intellects uh, really in, a, in the important position that he's in. So uh, great that he was here today. I'm glad, General Hyten, that you were able to get him to come out. And, um, and I, now I've got to follow Tim Sheriff in my remarks. So it's always another, another tough task for me. But it, but uh, pre appreciate we've we've worked together since uh, the North Northcom days, and appreciate what you and your soldiers do. So I want to I want to come at this today uh, from the airman's perspective a bit, and I'll I'll try to do that for you. You know, before I got into this missile defense business, late in my my military career at MDA at Jiamdo, and then prior to that, uh, United States Northern Command, I was a member of the Combat Air Forces and spent a lot of time in the KOC in places around the JFAC, and and I, I can tell you that uh, airmen have the utmost respect for the mission that you perform for the fight. Um, and you know, I saw that from top leaders uh, amongst the Air Force and, and naval airmen as well. Uh, anytime I was around them, just, just tons of praise and respect and appreciation for the mission that you deliver to the joint fight. So never, never lose sight of that. You know, I know there's some, some younger soldiers in the back of the room and, and, and maybe you can't appreciate that, but, but absolutely know that from the airmen's perspective, what you do, is vitally important, and we very, very much appreciate it. I also hearken back to my, uh, my time at Jiamdo, and you know, it was 2013, uh, then the Chairman, General Dempsey, and the Vice Chairman, Armand Winterfeld, came to us at Jiamdo and said, we want to codify the department's vision for integrated air missile defense in the year 2020. We want you to, to lay that out in a very succinct way, unclassified to the be do best you can. We want it to be a sort of a seminal document to be a guidepost, to be a guide for all the services and our joint partners around the world. And uh, very, very proud to work with the team to carry that off. And uh, General Dempsey signed that document. I think it was 2014. It still exists today. It's still a good work. But I want to quote you something from there that what really struck me recently. We, we said in that document that the future air and missile defense environment would be characterized by a full spectrum of breathing, air breathing and missile threats to include ballistic, cruise, Aircraft, unmanned systems, long-range rockets, artillery, mortars, all utilizing a range of advanced capabilities such as stealth, maneuver, decoys, and precision targeting. So how prescient were we to say the future in 2020 is going to look like this? The future looks like that now. Absolutely looks like that now. You're dealing with all those threats and those challenges now. And so I guess we were off on the timeline saying that, hey, around the 2020 time frame, this was going to happen. We also said around the 2020 time frame, we would realize this sort of integration nirvana. Maybe we didn't mean to think we were going to be all the way there. But I think, you know, it was only six, seven short years ago now, we thought we would be a lot further along as a joint force in the integration battle. And, and a lot of good work has happened since then. And this is, this is not an indictment of, of any one community or any one service or our department. But I think there's a lot more to be done in the integration realm. So when we talk about the, 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 the title of this panel is how to build more capacity, I think we have to keep that in mind. I doubt there's anyone in this room, and from the speakers I've heard thus far, that, that would predict that the demands on you as a community would be decreasing in any way. So there's an obvious temptation, and I think we've seen this in recent budgets, to kind of hit the easy button out a little bit, and that is just to buy more stuff, to increase capacity to train more soldiers, to demand more of our allies. And all those things are part of the equation, to be sure, and we've got to do those things. But these are necessary things. They are not, in and of themselves, sufficient. I'm fond of saying that more is not necessarily more when it's more of the same. And so we've got to get out of that mindset. Yes, we need more. Yes, we need more capacity. 
yes we need more training we need more of all those things but we've got to think about the problem differently as well and that's why i'm so keen on focusing on the challenge of integration and making sure that the stuff we have today and the outstanding soldiers we have to man them and the airmen sailors and uh, marines in the mix are equally integrated in the battle space so that's my focus today i want to maybe challenge you to think about capacity in a different way. Think about it in terms of integration, and then I'm going to really challenge you and have you think maybe even 15, 20 years in the future and how we might be able to do it. But first, integration. I think you're absolutely on the right path. And hearing the speakers this morning and, and just the comments from my panelists, I think you get it. I think there's a general realization that we've got to do a better job of integrating what we have closer together. How do we make those systems work better together, away from stovepipes, away from, as an industry guy now, away from proprietary systems? How do we in industry share that better with each other? Away from all those things and toward a more modular open system architecture approach. One that really is enabled by a true digital transformation that we can spend a whole day just talking about what's going on in the digital transformation space. And one that allows for, I'll call them technological insertion points as that threat that we talked about in Joint Vision 2020 that's now come to fruition earlier than we thought has come to fruition, we need to be have a, a design and to build capacity in terms of having capabilities placed into our systems that allow us to react to the threat as it continues to develop and mature and grow, which we know it will. Particularly, as has been mentioned several times already today, that now the focus from the national strategy level on the great power competition. Clearly, that threat's going to continue to develop, and we've got to have ways to deal with it. Integration, open systems, being able to have those approaches, I think is absolutely key. Greg said it well, integration is the next level. There's a realization that we got to get there. We're not there yet. No service is. My former service isn't. I, I dare say that I don't think the Army is there either. But I think we have a realization that that's where we need to get to. So let me now challenge you to kind of, if integration is the next thing, I think I would challenge you to think about something and just put this on the table, maybe food for thought. The next, next thing after that, I really think is taking advantage of something that I'll call just the C3 data fabric. It's forward thinking to be sure, but it's at the nexus of sensors, effectors, platforms, comms, and C2, providing an opportunity to position all the data in the battle space to enable a vision of forward thinking integrated air missile defense. Away from our current state, which I think remains largely siloed with respect to platforms, systems, or communities, services, tasked with collection and processing with little cross-apparatus synthesis, fusion, or dissemination, and toward a, a data-driven end state that takes advantage of a data fabric that provides a seamless integration, analysis, usability, and dissemination of disparate and distributed data streams across customers, systems, and domains. There's a whole lot of conversation now about multi-domain. We've heard it here today. Multi-domain is clearly part of that. But I think we can take it a step further. So how might the C3 data fabric apply here, and how might it increase the capacity for the Army in the future of Army air and missile defense? I would argue four ways. Number one, cross-operational levels of integration. So from the tactical all the way up to the strategic, information across those levels leveraged to generate a comprehensive COP and picture the battle space to optimize decision-making and efficiency of the, of the equipment and the tools that you have today. Two, a cross-system integration, so across platforms. In an airman's perspective, maybe it's a UAS talking to an F-35. How do I share that data amongst those platforms? And then taking it a step further into three, how do I share that across domains? I don't think we do either of those things particularly well today, and we need to get better at them. The data and the amount of data out there for the warfighter is just going to be more prolific and prolific as we go. We have to take advantage of the pieces of it that matter to the warfighter and making sure they have to be able to take advantage of that. And then lastly, cross-service or cross-national integration. That's a real challenge. It's been mentioned already. We've got to get there. There are a lot of policy issues that stand in that way, but it's one thing that we've got to get to the crux of the problem. We've got to be able to share and have the ability to share across our services in our own nation and then with our partners around the world. That end state of taking advantage of the data fabric, I think, will really be a game changer in how we apply greater capacity to the fight. So again, a couple of ideas I threw out on the table talking about integration. That's more short term. I think you're, we are on the right path collectively to do that. I think we could do better. 
and then really sort of longer term, taking advantage of this data fabric across all domains, all services, and all platforms, try to paint a better picture for the warfighter. Some forward thinking ideas there, but I just wanted to try to be provocative a bit and maybe have you thinking a little bit about how that might apply to this part of the equation. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I look forward to your questions. Yeah, I, I get the point that I'm the last one between you and lunch. Um, oh, no, we got 17 points. Thank you to uh, <laughs> General Ham, General Dickinson, and General Swan for inviting me. It's a privilege to be the uh, senior diversity pick of the day. <laughs> so uh, give you some perspectives from the Navy. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about Army systems and programs and uh, formations. I understood about one quarter of what I heard from uh, General Sheriff on the 536 this, the 748 that, and, you know, all the different things. Um, <laughs> well, I'm used to the South Carolina accent, but how many people know what DD-974 is? It was my command, actually. Um, so I want to talk, look at capacity. And um, I'll be blunt, as many people know me, most of the discussion today that I've heard go back and forth between capability and capacity to me is really about capability. It's about dBs and megahertzes and furlongs per fortnight and how fast the threat is coming and how low, how high, how soon. Capacity to me is the ability that you have at the fight to deal with what you have in the fight. Now you start, and capacity though of course has three levels, has strategic, operational, and tactical level. The strategic is what the Army thinks it needs to have available. The operational is what it's been able to in place in different AORs. And the tactical is what General Sheriff, to pick a warfighting commander, has available when he has to start shooting. And so how you look at that and, and how you think about it to me is key. And all three levels have to be considered, both in planning and in execution. And they have different apl applications and they're not the same. And what's more to the point is different people will have to execute them. Um, everyone who's heard me talk knows that I always go back to the basics of air defense or air and missile defense, which is both the capability to defeat the threat's ability to penetrate or evade our defenses and a capacity to defeat or mitigate the size and intensity and duration of the threat until you end the threat by other means. We're all proud of our community. We all know that air defense will never win a war but it damn sure will lose one. So the question is, how can we protect the force, execute the maneuver, and continue going until the rest of the force, and this is offense, defense, integration, and multi-domain, and um, you know, in, in, in uh, Navy Air Force speaks, you know, sea air battle and all that jazz. Um, so as long as we, we have to plan to understand we're gonna do that. So it's back to, you know, how do you how do you buy it? Well, that's at a strategic level, but the real problem, the real challenge is going to be getting it at the operational and tactical level. Um, capability is vital, but capacity is what makes having that capability worthwhile. It's not just about having stuff, and it's not just about having smart stuff. Is it in the right place at the right time when you need it? Having all the capability in the world carefully spread out through Europe for the Europe plan means nothing if you have to do the fight in Saudi Arabia and it ain't there. So you have to look at that and probably we'll never have enough stuff to put every length of capability we could possibly understand and capacity for it in each of the AORs. Um, that would be nice, but I don't think it's practical. So it's where, when, how you use it, and to be able to continuously do so as the fight progresses and circumstances change. That's what I've heard being described as the resilience to circumstance. Because you will have those and they will not be, as we all know, what we thought. The enemy gets a vote and the enemy also gets to keep voting. So it will change. So when I think about capacity, I think about it in, uh, I would propose thinking about it in five elements when you look at it. This assumes that each element is technically and operationally capable of performing as intended. That, of course, can be a different question. But the elements will be incapacity, when you think about it, the mix and quantity of sensors. That's been discussed a lot today. The mix and quantity of effectors. 
than the ability to integrate them effectively in technical space, a lot of what uh, Ken Todorov talked about, I think. The ability to integrate them effectively in planning space, multi-domain fires, and the ability to integrate them effectively in ongoing employment. This is back to the thing, you've got to keep doing it until the war is over. You can't end the war, but you've got to keep doing it until the war is over. Um, and of course, this is joint from the beginning and will have to be that way. Um, a lot of my thinking on that was developed over some years ago. Someone mentioned roving sands. And I had the pleasure of participating in some roving sands. And in, anybody remember the ASIET tests? ASCIET, all service combat integration and evaluation tests. Where we learned early on we had incredible ability to shoot down our own airplanes and to get bombed by our own forces. Seriously. And that's where a lot of things came out that I think started to drive where we are now today with um, uh, IBCS. It certainly drove CEC. We had these incredible cruisers out there which could kill anything in the sky and did. Um, and that was not necessarily a good answer. So going through those things of, you know, as we do our planning, what's the, and then that's all good, but when the war goes up, when a fight starts somewhere, it's obviously what's on the ground and the ability to adapt to that, which leads me to something that we have learned very painful and have not solved completely. We're working on uh, in the uh, Aegis program, which is uh, to have planners and planning tools that can operate in real time as things change, as you have to reposition forces, as you have to choose different um, effectors and sensors to apply to a given fight because sensors, if they're looking in one place, they're not looking in somewhere else. If you shoot this missile, you don't get it back. And where can you best position things? That's a little bit easier for us at sea than for you guys because I can move at about 30 miles an hour and you can't move a formation of air defense at that speed. Um, the downside is um, when I deploy, I deploy with 92 missiles. Someone gets to decide what mix of missiles it is, but it's 92. And when those 92 are gone, I got to go somewhere to reload, and it is not a four-hour evolution. So it's a back to the planning, which shifts with time. So when we talk about capacity, to me it's back to not only what do you have and how good is it, but what is your ability to plan to use it and then to use it as the circumstances vary. Because that's really the capacity that in the ideal world, it will never happen, but you can at least do the mind experiment of you run out of your last air defense munition just after the enemy runs out of threats. Now, you'd like to have a little bit more or less than that, but that does count as success, and it's back to the point of air defense is to enable the fight and to enable victory in the fight. We can't win it, but we have to make sure that we don't lose it. So when I think about capacity, I think about it through that way. What do we have? What do our partners have? What will they bring to the fight? What did they show up with? And then how can you most effectively incorporate that into the fight both on their arrival and yours, and then how time goes on. Some of it is doctrinal, some is technical, um, some is incorporating all sorts of other fires. Uh, General Dickinson's um, comments, um, uh, my boss at the Cypress International, uh, Dave Halverson, which I think a number of you people know, and who spent a large part of his life thinking about that problem. So. Um, That's, I just sort of wanted to point that out that way. Um, we're doing a lot in capability. We're doing a lot in capacity. It's great to hear about all the stuff that's going on in the Guard. Um, I was incredibly impressed when I was, got my, when I was Jamdo and got my first brief on um, uh, NCR and the BDOC and all the things that they were doing there. And like most people, maybe it's obviously not used news to you, but to most people outside of the Army Air Defense community going, these are Guard guys? Oh, yes, yeah, sir. The Guard is doing the air defense of the United States. Well, I don't think most people understand that. So anyway, I would like to stop there. Um, I applaud the steps the Army is taking. I would, if I may, offer that you think about it sort of in those five ways of 
um, how you uh, would consider building the ability to plan to execute using the stuff that you have and where it may end up. And um, as always, someone said earlier on, getting and achieving the ability to fight tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks, Arch. Appreciate it. So I have some several great questions uh, from the audience, and I'd ask that as we as I go through these, I'll just ask that your answers be brief uh, so we can get through a couple of the questions before we go off to lunch, because uh, we do have about 45 more minutes uh, before we go to lunch. No, I mean, just a few more minutes. So. Okay, see who's awake out. Let's go. So the U.S. Army has uh, grown accustomed to operating a battlefield where the U.S. and allies have always had air supremacy. Uh, with what we've been talking about today and the threats, has there any discussion going on uh, about how the Army would adapt to potential scenarios where they may not have air supremacy? Uh, you've spoken primarily about active systems and buying more missiles and effectors, but any other discussions? And I'll pass it off to uh, Colonels Brady and Birchfield to give us a, a quick uh, answer there. Um, any other discussions about that in warfighting seminars? Uh, I think one of you touched on it earlier. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you know, especially with roving sands coming back as an exercise, but. Uh, you know, without the air superiority, we've uh, dealt with these at uh, COCOM exercises uh, and where maybe less defense counter air is available. And so that really relies upon the role of the, really, the Army Air Missile Defense Commander. In the joint world is the Deputy Air Air Defense Commander, and it has to have that dialogue and figure out what's the best posture for forces. Um, and even more so important, and we, I still believe we touched on capacity, is with our allies. Uh, because I thought uh, Admiral Macy uh, highlighted that point very well, you know, what do they have? And that's why this the event I talked about, Cobra Legacy, is important because knowing what your allies have to mitigate some of these capacity challenges. But one thing I did not mention um, with that is the challenges on foreign disclosure and policy. And I'm glad you brought that up because that was – one of the reasons why it was personal because they had those challenges and started building the relationships. And you know the relationships are one of the most important things because you can't surge trust overnight. You know, the term request for forces, you can't RFF trust. But then how do we bring this together uh, with the foreign disclosure and policy? And so what our team has done at the Department of the Army G357 is taken on this task. Um, and so work closely with uh, General Ganey, Colonel Shank from the 10th, General Spillman, and of course, uh, they haven't worked much with General Sheriff on that yet for the homeland, but these are issues that we are synchronizing and integrating across not only the Army staff, but a lot of these are at the DOD level. Uh, so we've taken that on to mitigate these aspects. Thanks, appreciate it. What I would add is that uh, as we operate in a contested environment, you know, as we uh, look at the portfolio, what is it that uh, from a science and technology perspective and then also the strategic capabilities office, those efforts and also with, uh, you know, SMDC with conventional prompt strike and, and some of those uh, other uh, initiatives, you know, what technologies do we as a community bet on that will help operating in that uh, contested environment, and then when is the appropriate time to put funds towards that effort in order to perhaps transition that technology into a program of record? That really becomes the challenge as we as we look to manage the portfolio. Thanks. So this question, uh, the next one I'd like to throw out is <coughs> maybe for Dan and for, for Arch. Is, uh, is there, what organization do you think today is in the best uh, position to bridge offensive and defensive capability discussions? Uh, such as countering hypersonic weapons and evolving threats. Is there an organization that has the right authorities or the right influences to, to ensure both programmatic as well as policy changes? Because we talk about so much this cross, uh, you know, cross functional areas there. So if I could ask Dan, maybe Archie, give us a comment on that. Yeah. So uh, great question because I think that's one that we're wrestling with right now in a lot of in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, one would automatically turn to NDA because of the science and technology that's related to, to getting after some of these uh, requirements. But certainly when you come back to a policy question, you have to come back to looking at uh, who has the equities, uh, biggest equities in that, uh, in that fight. And, you know, OSD will clearly want to have a say in, in what those policies are. The Army certainly has to have uh, a say at the table. And so uh, I think if you were going to pin the rose on somebody uh, to at least – lead the fight uh, in this in, in developing some of those capabilities, or at least in the science and technology, 
Uh, you'd have to give it to MDA, but then you certainly have to turn to the Army in order to execute the outcome. Thanks. Arch? Yeah, I would agree. Um, MDA, from a technical uh, and cap um, technical capabilities point of view, the S&T, um, there is not a single entity for the joint uh, part of it. Um, betraying a, a, a little bit of my dissatis dissatisfaction with some decisions since my tenure, I would have said Giambo was the place to look, but that has effectively been gutted. Um, so um, they're not available anymore to address that. They're there, but it's a skeleton that they effectively can't really address it. Um, and that is not a reflection of the wonderful people who are still at Giambo. It's just speaking of capacities. The place I would start in the near term um, that I would task to look at this would be um, probably SMDC or throw it to the fire center. Because when you start talking about cross-domain fires and you know, a a any sensor, any shooter, any system, any effect, I think they're farther down the road than anybody else. I'm not aware of an Air Force organization that is that way, and certainly the Navy is not. We are still way too stovepiped on how we look at integrated fires, so to speak, um, and integrated air defense. We're getting pretty good with our own airplanes, partially with the Air Force, but I don't believe that we are anywhere near where we need to be with the Army. Thank you. So I would say those two, MDA and either SMDC or the Fire Center, in the ideal world, I would go to those two CGs and say, I want your second best colonel, he works for me and start down that road. Super, thank you. So uh, this one probably goes to the, our, our representatives from the Army staff here today. Is uh, We've talked about a test unit already, but do we really have enough capacity uh, for THAAD and Patriot units to enable periodic upgrades without, able, without degrading our ability to support warfighter requirements in the field? Short answer, no. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, the strategic portfolio analysis review that I spoke to is an annual event that, that uh, again, our, where our portfolio goes in front of the chief and we, we talk about priorities and then we talk about the strategy. So SPAR 20, what we looked at was uh, the midterm from uh, 26 to 35. You know, what, what does that strategic environment look like? And then are we properly postured in order to fight uh, in, in that type of environment? And then it, you know, it goes into literally rack and stacking from one to N of what we think those programs sh should be and what level should they be funded to. And then, uh, you know, obviously we, we present that as a community to the chief and we go through uh, cross portfolio to determine, you know, again, um, how does that tie into the Army modernization priorities? How does that tie into fight tonight capabilities? And there's a rack and stack across uh, the Army to determine, you know, w what's most important, if you will, and then what level of funding, um, you know, that occurs at. So, but, uh, you know, within, within our portfolio, the fires portfolio, there is, you know, mon money that's intended to be um, RDT and E and then also procurement, but it's, you know, it's that balance between the two. But, you know, certainly in baked into um, each program of record is uh, uh, an intention to continue to modernize that, that, that equipment or that late, the latest software drop. And I'll turn it over to Greg if you have anything else to add. The only thing I would add is just to balance that from the program aspect, but we have to look at the operational requirements, and that's the most important then is looking across our combatant commands at the integrated priority list. And as Carolyn said, you rack and stack and understanding what are our capacity challenges. And most importantly, where do you want to assume risk? Okay, thanks. So I think we are actually out of time according to the big timer there. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. So Time for one more. Okay, so we'll do one more. So, so let me, let me, there's a, there's a good question here. Let me see if I can probably back to, uh, <clears throat> to Ken and uh, to start with here is, uh, and I'm going to shorten this question up. I apologize to the person who wrote this, but uh, it, when we look at all the IAMD capabilities we've talked about today is we know that uh, what's our ability uh, and what are we doing? What are your suggestions and thoughts uh, to engage 
particularly non-ballistic targets, at maximum targeting ranges possible. We know that a lot of our effectors and our sensors aren't because the way they've been developed haven't been paired together properly over the years, just because the normal way of doing business. So what, do we, what are your thoughts about getting out, maximizing capability? Because you talked about integration pretty heavily. So maybe you could pull on that a little bit, I think would be a good way to start. Yeah, my, my first thought is back to this point, as sort of alluded to, this digital transformation point that um, you know, we're, develop we're on the precipice now of sensors, all of industry is, not just my company, that, that really has the ability to, rather than do, um, you know, tile changes, we can do software upgrades on a digital, an all digital sort of system, and that allows you to really kind of react as the threat does change and mature, it's sort of a, one of those technological insertion points again. Uh, I, I would say that we got to look to the future of this whole all digital systems, digital transformation, and that might provide just a short answer to some clues to how we get at the non-ballistic threats a lot quicker, and particularly as they change and evolve. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on that last question from anybody? Okay, if not, I think we are done. Thank you very much for the great questions and great support. Yeah, I got to I got to I'll head to the airport in a few minutes.